Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the Native Voices in STEM alumni lunch series this semester. I really appreciate your being with us today to hear Dr. Lohat talk. Uh, I would like to introduce an Indigenous Food, Energy, and Water Security and Sovereignty and University of Arizona Sloan Indigenous Graduate Partnership Fellow, Nikki Tole, who's a PhD candidate in environmental sciences, who will introduce our speaker today. Thank you. Um, good morning. So I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Little Hat to you all. So uh, this is in part for Indigenous and Sloan um, coming together to bring us this presentation today. So we're, what we're really grateful for. So Dr. Little Hat is from Red Mesa, Arizona, which is a small community on the Utah Arizona border. And a lot of his work has focused on water and the environment. He earned his Bachelor's of Science in Environmental Engineering from the Northern Arizona University. And he also had come to uh, the University of Arizona and was also a Sloan um, fellow, which is pretty awesome to hear about. Um, he had had experience of working with Los Alamos National Laboratory and also working with um, IBM. And we're um, happy to hear from him, from him today to share more with us about um, some of the work that he's doing. So thank you, Dr. Little Hat, for coming to us today. Thank you. <laughs> Be back. It's been a while since I've been here, and um, it's really good to see familiar faces. Um, faculty, Karen, and so, um, so then also thank you too, Donna, for putting this together. I know Donna, uh, you've asked me to come here. So um, it's been a while since I've been here, but I'm, I'm really glad that I'm here. It's so one of the things I've noticed is there's all these buildings here. There's some over here, and there's all these buildings <laughs> over here. And <laughs> Those were all weren't there when I left, so it's pretty cool. So basically, um, I'm a district engineer. I, I work for the Indian Health Service. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. And currently, my office is in uh, Fort Defiance, Arizona. Um, <clears throat> if anybody has questions, you could either ask me or just go ahead and email me. I wrote it on here. So uh, just about anything, it could be about the Sloan program, or because because I was involved with the Sloan uh, right from the get go. So Dr. Velez, uh, the great Dr. Velez, used to always enjoy telling the story about how I got involved with the, the Sloan program. And so basically, I was the student union. I was deciding whether or not to accept this position or this position. <clears throat> and here comes Dr. Velez, and she came in and. She talked about the Sloan program and how I can get involved and there's funding available, this fellowship, and I can continue my research. And so basically she twisted my arm. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, so I, I called back some of those uh, those uh, companies that offered me a position and I asked them, hey, can you just hold off on that? Let me go after this uh, PhD degree and I'll give you a call back when I'm done. Uh, Down is it? Yeah, yes, yeah, down, down arrow. Is it not is it working? Is it here? Okay, here we go. Yeah, it's still not working. Oh, that's fine. I can probably just press the space button. Uh, I need to that. And that's not working either. It was just working a while ago. Cool. Well, you, Stephanie has one. No, but it's not working on that. Yeah, so we troubleshooted and that just worked just fine. I just checked it a while ago. I know we're working through something. Yeah, that's, uh, we just can't get the slides to advance, period. Oh. <laughs> or is it on your. Uh, it's the, the slideshow, it's, mm. it's up here. So thank you, Stephanie. Yeah. Um. So the next slide was about the uh, wall of well, uh, towers fixing that. Um, and you, you, you gave my whole introduction. Uh, <laughs> so there it is. Um, I could talk about this all day now, about me now. <laughs> so yes, I, I am from um, Red Mesa, Arizona. It's a very small community. And how many of you know where Red Mesa is? It's a very small community there. And there's basically a school and a store. And that recently, there's been a hospital that's been built. 
So basically, um, I did get my degrees from here, but I basically just two buildings down right here. Bob Arnold, who's actually here with us, was my, my advisor. And, uh, <laughs> so Bob, 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 day one. So one of the questions I had for him is, do I really talk to Arnold or uh, did they call me Bob? So I can call him that. And, uh, so uh, thank you, Bob, for coming. And this probably a year ago, we were reconnected. And I know you're involved with some projects up in the network area. So I'm really glad to see you involved with that. So we just had uh, our little meeting, and I'd like us to continue that. Um, I did get my degree from uh, NAU, and also my advisor for uh, when I was at NAU was uh, Willie Odom. And Willie Odom, actually, his advisor was also Dr. Arnold. So, um, I, I got experience. Uh, this is the question that I wanted to just kind of address here. When I got my bachelor's degree, I worked uh, for IBM Corporation for about three years. Uh, and then I decided to go back to school right after uh, working for IBM. So that's how I ended up in Tucson. So when I, when I eventually did graduate, I then uh, took a position with uh, Garland Caldwell. They had me start in Phoenix, and it was around that time when the economy was going down. And so then they offered me a position in Denver, so then I moved to Denver. But basically, my responsibilities were basically the same. I was, I was doing design. I got pretty good with um, designing pump stations, basically selecting pumps. And um, it could be for different applications. It could be a, a small pump, or it could be a huge pump. And like a building as uh, big as this. Uh, so I got pretty good, uh, at, but I decided to, well, a lot of things happened here, but eventually I ended up back in uh, the Nambo area with IHS. So I started as field engineer in Mini Farms, Arizona, and I, I did that for six years. And then uh, somebody probably said I was doing a good job, so that I was offered a position as a district engineer. So I've been doing that for about three years now. And uh, for the clients. So, um, this is probably where the most fun is being a field engineer. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, let's see, let's try it now. Okay, here we go. So, this is this is the general agenda. One of the things I just want to say is if you guys have questions, you don't have to wait to the end, just raise your hand. Um, but this is kind of like the general uh, agenda that I have here. I'll talk about IHS. Uh, program is called the SFC program, the Water and Sanitation Facilities Program. Uh, and this is uh, really for the students. I really wanted to just kind of emphasize this for the students. Uh, this is a field, this is a picture that I took out in the field and uh, this actually won and uh, some gave some recognition. Uh, basically we're just we're doing a project out in the field. Um, so it has all the activities going on, and I think it's maybe the color. I don't know if it's the remoteness, but um, that's the kind of work I really enjoy, but I don't really do that as much anymore. <clears throat> so back in the 40s and the 50s, when um, IHS was being developed, um, there were these hospitals that were being created. <clears throat> and during that time, there were a lot of, it seems like, common incidences of um, either sicknesses or even deaths just related to like, the stomach and the intestines and also babies too and very young babies are just um, getting sick or they're either dying. So somebody uh, realized that a lot of these were happening because there was lack of access to safe drinking water. So um, and that's how we exist, uh, this program that I'm a part of. Uh, came to be because uh, we were, now we're addressing this issue. So it's better to provide um, this infrastructure, safe drinking water to families, than to hire uh, probably doctors. Um, it wasn't really addressing the problem. So that's how this program was created. Was that, um, so this is our justification here why we exist. So you can see the incidence of uh, these types of uh, mortalities or dropping um, as we get more facilities to Indian homes. <clears throat> so 
So back in the 19, late 1950s, there was a program created, it's called Public Law 86-121. Uh, basically, that law states that Congress was charged with providing safe water uh, and sewer facilities to Indian homes. Uh, there's also one where we, where we provide uh, solid waste disposal facilities, but in our program over at, um, in the Navajo area, we're not too involved with this because we're really busy trying to catch up with providing that safe drinking water and safe sewer facilities to homes. Um, and then this is um, for American Indians and also Alaska Native homes too. <clears throat> And the IHS, basically, it's broken up into like 12 areas. Um, so here's Tucson here. And then there's uh, Navajo area. Navajo has its own area. And then there's all these different areas that are broken up. Um, these are tribes within the state. So it's not the entire state of California. It's just tribes in that state. Uh, and then Alaska, the state of Alaska has its own area. Uh, so right now, Headquarters or our bosses um, that sit in Washington, D.C., um, are putting a lot of emphasis in uh, people who don't have water. Basically, uh, they don't have running water and they don't have um, sanitation facilities. So, a lot of these other areas um, actually they're, they're kind of caught up on providing those facilities and the infrastructure to the Indian community. But I, in my, in my opinion, the Navajo area and also the Alaska areas are basically almost like a generation behind. So we're trying to catch up and providing that infrastructure to them. So that's the reason why we've been getting more funding than the other areas. <coughs> and then the other areas, um, they get funding, but most of the funding is usually for operation and maintenance type work. They still get money to serve those homes most of the money actually is used to just kind of upkeep, do upkeep work for their existing facilities. Whereas Alaska and the Navajo area, we don't, there's no such facility. There, there is some, but we still got a ways to go. <clears throat> so this is pretty common. Um, these are pictures, and obviously they're not from the 1940s or 1950s. This is very common in the sales today in the Navajo area. So these are the people, these are the people that we target. Um, people still lack water, um, adequate sanitation facilities. Um, we we're talking earlier about um, many, many families still get water from uh, basically from unregulated drinking water sources. They can be stock water. So then some of those stock waters have high levels of uranium or either um, are iron. So there, we still, we still, you know, are addressing that, and those are the ones that we want to get get away from. Because we want to still, we want to provide those facilities to individual homes. <clears throat> so with an IHS, we in the SFC program, we have four types of projects. One is a scatter project, and then that one basically, uh, it's it's a home. It could be a, a mobile home, or it could be a brand new home that was built near a water line. <clears throat> so something like that is pretty straightforward. Um, we just connect them to the existing facilities and then we provide them the, like a septic tank and some sort of a sewer facility. And then there's also the failed sewer facilities program. And then the funding for that comes from EPA. Um, basically, we're just replacing what they have. Um, one good example could be maybe a couple that received a facility and I don't know, maybe 25 years later, 25 years later, now they have 10 kids, who knows? But their system is now a small system now, or maybe grandma moved in and now they have more people there. So the facility that we provided for them back then was only adequate for two people, but now there could be maybe 10 people living in the home. So that's, a good example of uh, why some of these facilities fail. Um, and this is the one that I was talking about earlier. Um, we still have got a, a ways to go uh, providing, providing water and also uh, sewer facilities. So some of these projects are, some of them are straightforward, but a lot of them are complex. 
pipes through we're, we're putting water through the technical terrain but also um, there's another part of it, another element and that is sometimes it's very difficult to work with community it's the very community that wants their home homeowners their community members to be provided with these facilities but uh, also it's some of those same people that it's really hard to get their support because they would say things like, okay, we, we need it, but don't build it on my land. Uh, so that's the part that we, we struggle with. Uh, so therefore, there's a lot of stakeful, stakeholders involved. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. And then usually in those kind of scenarios, when it's that complex, um, usually I would like to have an experienced engineer on that project because Usually there's politics involved and um, it's not just strictly just engineering or design. There's a lot of other factors involved. But the whole goal is that we want to provide uh, water services and sanitation facilities. And also the last part is uh, community well projects that we take on too. So some of these wells, they were, they, they were built maybe back in the 60s or 70s. And back then when those wells were drilled and provided, there was that. But now we're talking about 20, 30 years later, and the population has gotten a lot bigger. So now those those wells are not enough to keep up with that large larger population. So now we, we have to fill the uh, wells now. So this these kind of projects, we I prefer to have experienced engineers on those projects. So just for the same reason here. Do we have any engineers here? Are there engineering students in the yeah? Yeah, it would um, I guess when I first started in the Sloan program, my I wasn't really thinking IHS. I was thinking, okay, I just want to get a job and go back to work. But um, I'll talk a little bit more about that also. But right now, with the, in our program, we're really in need of engineers. Um, it's not because we just want, we want them, but we're actually identifying the need now. We're, we've actually gotten pretty good about <clears throat> identifying. We do a lot of studies, and we're identifying people that really need the water. And then we put a price tag on it, and then also we do a good enough job now that it's actually we get funding for it. And then, but as a result of that, we're getting all of these projects given to us and they're which ones to build it. But we just don't have the staff. Uh, so in our, for instance, in my district here, um, I'm looking for an entry level engineer, but I'm also looking for a uh, senior level engineer too. <clears throat> What's PE required? PE is a, it's a registration oh, for engineering. Sure. Yeah. So usually somebody with a PE, um, when, the, when the design package is created, and they're usually given that assignment to um, review the design, to make sure everything is designed properly. There's usually a, a stamp involved and it's to state that I looked at it and it's good to go, it's legitimate, you can now build it. <clears throat> I have a couple of slides here that shows what we do. And this is, how many of you know where Round Rock is? So, do you recognize that tank? No, that one's right off the road. But from the very beginning, um, I mean, this is, this is during the construction phase. But one of the really nice things for me as a fuel engineer was that you decide where you want these facilities to be built. And that's one of the cool things about being an engineer. You decide when, when I'm out there. You know, you just rub your chin a little, you kind of point here and there. <laughs> I want it over here. No, let's put it over here. And so that's part of being an engineer. But uh, yeah, I didn't I actually, uh, I wasn't a part of the, the planning phase of that, but I'm pretty sure that's what happened. So eventually, and then also somebody decided that that tank is going to be tall rather than wide. So an engineer had to decide that. So that's one of the cool things. Even the color too. I don't want that beige. <laughs> this is this is my project here. Uh, this was sort of I would consider to be a complex project. 
um, there's a whole community that didn't have uh, water. And for the longest time, those homes were identified. But the, um, I guess the design and everything wasn't really, uh, it wasn't really complete. And I was even encouraged not to really consider this because uh, it's what they call infeasible and therefore kind of precious. Maybe just verify the homes and then verify the numbers, the preliminary design, and then wrap it up and that's it, and then move on to the next project. But this project was existing for a really long time, so I just felt we, we should build it, we need to build it, we need to find a way to build it. So I, I got stakeholders, different types of funding sources involved with this. So in the end, we were able to fund this project. So here's a water line. Basically, once the water, just like any system, we deal with it. We put in the water, we bury it, and then we just introduce water. That's what provides the water to the homes. And here's another one. What we want to do is get away from the outhouses. Uh, so this is. We provide homes with a septic tank and then also a, um, an infiltration system. And this is in ground rock. And these are types of um, sanitation facilities that we install. Um, this is what they call an Elgin system. Um, usually, if the soil is, um, there's limitation to the infiltration. Or there's not enough footprint in the area, we provide them something like this. But also, if there's a large area, and then we would provide them with it. But it, it all does the same thing. I have a question about the septic tanks. Yeah. Um, once a <coughs> home gets that, what's involved in terms of like sometimes it fills up? Is there a cost to disposal? Because yeah. I know that's been a hardship for some families back home. Yeah. And, you know, it's always like, don't let the dishwater drain because the septic tank's full and we haven't emptied it. So mm -hmm. we're using the water from the faucet in a bucket, and then we dump the bucket outside. So mm -hmm. is that is that problematic for a lot of families, even though that, you know, yeah. it's there for sanitation and it has a specific yeah. To address the need one of the I think one of the problems before I got on board was that there was lack of education to the homeowners. Mm -hmm. So we would provide the hardware. We, we do all the plumbing uh, to the home, and we do all the plumbing and all the everything for the home for the wastewater system. So once it's built and then everything's functional, the whole um, ownership of that. Is given to the homeowner, so that's where the education probably is, was lacking. Yeah. So we're doing a better job now, where we can tell the homeowner, "This is yours now." I like to use the example of a vehicle. Usually, when people if they buy a brand new vehicle, there's a warranty with it. Mm -hmm. So if something goes wrong with it, then you have to take it in, and it's, I'm still under my warranty, so it still applies. And mm -hmm. So some like transmission would fail or whatever, and then it will get fixed. But when the warranty expires, and then it's up to you to, as a vehicle owner to fix it. Maybe the tires wore out. Maybe it even needs an oil change or something needs to be done to maintain the engine of that vehicle. The, pe the person who owns that vehicle has to pay for that. So it's the same concept here. Um, <coughs> so there is a cost to get the septic tank pumped, and that's the, the responsibility on that lies with the homeowner. So that's the part where I think we weren't doing a good job of it before, where it filled up, and they would come to our office and they would tell us, hey, it's failing. But it was really their responsibility to check it, maintain it, and then mention to the pump. <clears throat> yeah. I have a septic tank, and the builder put a uh, carburetor in the sink. Uh, 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 Grind, to grind stuff up in the sink. And I'm told using that with the septic tank is a bad idea because there'll be little tiny particles that will foul up the drain, the drain field. Probably. <clears throat> but nobody told me, and I'm a well educated person in an expensive neighborhood. <coughs> yeah, you probably didn't need that grinder. I didn't need it. No. You so we don't it. use it, but it's, it's still it's hard not to do it every now and then because you do have to drain your sink. 
you probably could if you had a longer retention in the septic tank. Sometimes um, there are systems where there's a septic tank and followed by another septic tank. So mm. the retention on that is longer. So there's a little bit more time for what, even though you ground them up in your solids, they can still, still settle. Whereas here, the retention time is a lot smaller because the compartment's smaller here in the septic tank. So it's better not to do that. Just let it everything going to that so it's more than, but they don't it, it, it's it's sort of a system problem with builders <coughs> install things that should not be installed yeah yeah how much is a whole unit like that what's the cost you're talking about the cost of serve a home or to well, just no, the hardware yeah. oh oh um i would say about ten thousand dollars perhaps Something thing like this would cost about Maybe anywhere from twelve hundred to eighteen hundred, depending on the size. But that's just the material itself, and then of course there's people you got to pay, and then you got to bring out the equipment. Like for instance, this one, this is like a crane. That's putting, this is a concrete septic tank. So then of course you got to pay them, and then you got to pay for the transport of that machine and all of that. And so who, and who gets paid? Is it I just? We, we go after the money, the so we, we create a project and then we um, propose uh, this is how much it's going to cost and we submit it as a proposal and then if it's, um, let's say it's competitive among other proposals, we, get, we would get the money for that. So when we get the money, we would give that money to the contractor. In the network area, it's NECA. So we would give them the money. We would tell them you need to build this based on these drawings right here. Mm. So everything's already all designed. We, we, we tell NECA, this is how long we want the system to be. This is how many roads we want it. So they would do all of that. <clears throat> yeah. You, you, um, does NECA have to bid on these contracts or is there a long-term mega contract that they've already bid on? No, well, that's one of the unique things about NAVO here is they work just solely with NECA. Unless if the project is pretty complex, like a well drilling project, NECA doesn't do that. We contract that out and we go through the bidding process. But something like this, this is something that NECA does in-house. Is there any emphasis on development of NAVO businesses? Yeah, a lot of that. I, we encourage that. So it's not required, but usually I like to get those those Navajo businesses involved. So even just the studies, like civil engineers, that we need somebody to uh, do a study of where we want the water tank to be. So usually we've been going to somebody down in California or somewhere. Well, there's Navajos that, are, that can do that now. So those are the kind of people that I look for. So. Yeah. So along with the education you're providing the homeowner, is there funding available for them to get the septic tank? No, that's that's all on them. That, that, that's where I was giving you the example of the, with the vehicle. So the, the person who owns a vehicle, they have to pay for this is it's the same concept. So we just provide the hardware to them. And then they need to pay for the septic pumper. Or anything wrong, let's say um, a pipe broke, or let's say the sewer for some reason, maybe underneath the sink you have this peat trap, maybe something happened here, the roof was leaking. Well, they have to fix that. <clears throat> okay. So this is the same picture I had earlier. This is actually my project. I took this picture here. Um, a couple of years later, I looked on Google Earth, and it's, there it is. So you can see a lot of these on Google Earth now. So you can see the scar, and you can even see the septic tank up right there. So this is a flow chart um, when we're creating projects. Um, this is a must right here. Uh, we propose a project. And this is the part where I was giving you an example. You're on the field, and you're just rubbing your chin, and going around. So out in the field, you're you're doing uh, you're doing the proposal, and then you come to your, back to your office, and then you do your design. It's very preliminary, but the whole idea is that you're, you know, we want to go after funding for that. And then once the funding becomes available, then we do the hydraulic modeling, and then we do the design work. 
So when we're done with that, that's where we, we see these engineers walking around with thick rolls of paper and making it all cool. And, <laughs> hard so, that's what it says right there. So, so once the drawings are done, those 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 packages are then given to the local utility, and also it's also given to EPA. They review it, and then from there, uh, any questions that they have, we'll address it, and then it's it's approved, and then we go into construction. So one one box I didn't add to this is the close out and that's the part that was, that's my favorite because when the water is turned on it's activated that's when people come and we do the homeowner training then too because all the people will come back to the chapter house and then that's where we come this is how you maintain the system so usually in TUA the, the utilities there too with their laptop and then they would actually activate and create accounts for those for the water system so it's a it's a really nice time I think because we're starting from scratch and then we're going down to turn on the water. That was a question I had was how NTUA um, is is related to your work. Mm -hmm. It sounds like they come at the end when everything's on and the system's going. Yeah, they're, okay. they're, they're involved from, from the beginning too, before construction, because they look at the actual drawings because they want to make sure that whatever's going to be built is going to be okay with. Because in the end, the maintenance of that is going to be, it's going to be theirs to maintain. How many of these systems do you install every year? Um, probably two or three per year, yeah. We have one that we'll, we'll be turning on next week. It's a kind of a smaller system, but uh, it, it depends on the staffing, too. If we have more staff, uh, we can do more. But because we don't really have the staff, uh, we have to do one at a time, unfortunately. So we get behind on that. I'm trying to also get a concept of, I mean, the septic tank mm -hmm. um, distribution. So like if you're doing it in a community, um, <laughs> is it one septic tank serves so many households in that region or is it that a family's home site where you might have like a hogan, a house, a trailer, you might have extended relatives, you know, maybe a couple more the small homes. Yeah. Does one septic tank serve just that? Well in our family? well there's there's two types of uh, sewer facilities. One is called on site sewer system and the other one is uh, they're connected directly to the community gate system community gate. It could be a wastewater treatment plant. Or it could be a community <coughs> lagoon. So a community lagoon and a community wastewater treatment plant, um, those are just there's no septic tank involved with that. The water just comes straight out and goes directly connected to a community main sewer line. And then that's that gravity flows to uh, one of the treatment processes. Whereas if it's on site, there is a septic tank involved. And there is a septic tank for each home. So we do uh, what's called a community lagoon, like our camp lagoon, but basically it's just an evaporator pond system where, um, let's say there's a, a family living all close together, so all clustered together. We would still provide each one of them a septic tank. And each house. Each home would still get a septic tank. And then from there, uh, they would just be connected to a main sewer line to their camp, camp lagoon. So the, the whole purpose of that, um, it's just a drying bay, that's, that's the primary purpose. It's not to collect solids and because that's where the vector problem is going to begin. So a lot of the, what, what's called like a BOD, that's all collected in the, most of this, majority of this collected by the septic tank. So each home would still need to get the septic tank pumped. When an engineer starts with uh, the program, they usually are kind of like down here. And then these field technicians that they've been there for a really long time, these guys are the ones with most knowledge. And they're, they can be there for 20 to 40 years. And sometimes when they're pretty good at what they do, uh, maybe they have a desire to manage projects. So this is usually the case maybe after 20 years of their work. So they want to be project managers. And usually a project manager, they're a little bit older because they have more experience. 
Uh, we've given projects that are really straightforward, like the scatter project that I was talking about. But this is as far as they go here. Usually they retire, and they usually retire. We have two guys right now. They're one person has 35 years, <laughs> and the other person just finished 40 years with IHS. Whereas engineers, they're doing equivalent work, but they're just sometimes they're straight out of college right here. And then there's different levels of engineers. Sometimes there's a beginning level, as I mentioned. Sometimes they're more advanced level, senior level engineers. And somebody might see you doing really good work and you're demonstrating, you're getting things done. And, and then you may be considered for an office manager position. And then if you're doing really good with that, then you're considered for an assistant district engineer and then a district engineer. So this is where I'm at right here. Um, I don't know what they do, but <laughs> all, I know is, <laughs> all I know is that you get more right here. It's, it's more accessible. But um, I would say that any program, regardless if it's IHS or not, you can go into the private sector. This is pretty much a, a model. Um, most of the technical work is all done down here, and then from there, you start losing it because you're managing people now and then you're managing the program. Yeah. How, how much of the uh, engineering technical work do you guys do in house versus how much do you have to contract out? Well, it depends on uh, the engineers here. Um, I've done all of mine in house, I've done all my design because of the experience from the, the private sector. But sometimes um, certain other districts, when they're doing like a huge cluster station, they would just uh, fit it out for an uh, engineering firm to come in. They would do a design for that. Mm. Whereas for me, I would, I would do it. Especially like you mentioned that sometimes you're behind a little bit or, or you got to do one. Yeah, we're looking into that. Yeah, we're, we have a lot of work here. Some of these uh, simple, uh, what I would call like a simple project where you just get all your NEPA requirements complied with. And then what I want to do is I want to just take that and give it to NECA. They can fit it out or they can do it themselves where we're not involved with anything after that. <clears throat> so how much is the game going to change as Native American water rights get settled? They, they are settled in Mexico. It looks like pretty close to Utah, but not so much in, in Arizona. He's going to make, it seems like there's going to be a lot more water available for big projects. Yeah, there's one right now in uh, the, the BOR <coughs> project, and they're, they're currently working on this uh, water line from Farmington to Gallup. So uh, I know that this, the tribe is working on a water line extension from Yatehe, New Mexico, and extending that water towards Wonder Rock, which is in Arizona. But they have to settle the water rights issues first before that water is introduced into Arizona. And that would help dramatically because uh, we don't have to drill for wells anymore. We just use that as our primary water source. So going after wells probably would just maybe go away. Uh, there would certainly would be more inner ties where we're connecting systems. One system here is maybe, let's say this is Wonder Rock here. West of Wonder Rock is uh, Kinfichi, which is next to Ganado. And then there's jet and tail, and that could all just be one water system. Whereas right now they're individual systems. Will you guys get involved in irrigation systems? No, no, we're we're just primarily involved with um, addressing the these water needs and sanitation facilities. That's a different program. Who who does oversee that? On um, the tribe. Okay. Yeah, the tribe. They're involved with that. But there is there there are work groups who try to just stay in the loop on what's going on and water rights issues or anything. Uh, maybe the Navajo Nation Department of Water Resources, maybe they're going to be drilling more wells that I just is not aware of. So when we're part of these work groups, we get to know what other uh, departments or organizations are doing. So this is an example here. Um, this is in many farms. Uh, this is where I started out. I was one of the engineers. And when I first started there, I was the, there were three other engineers there already. So I was the fourth engineer. But now we only have two field engineers and they're both 
relatively new. Um, they're graduates of ASU. <laughs> no, but they're they're really good. They're really good engineers, and I'm really glad I have them. Um, we have two project managers. Like I said, they're they're getting getting they're getting close to retirement. And we have field technicians, and these guys are the ones that get work done uh, for us. And obviously, the secretary, and basically, it's the same type of work I mentioned before that we're doing. And so four, four project engineers, um, project managers, and still that's not enough to take on the work that we're taking on right now. So I'm gonna transition from that to um, leadership that I wanna talk about. I really wanna talk really for the students and, um, and I'm kind of gonna deviate from being a technical person here. Uh, this is what I believe in. This is my philosophy here that in order to be a really good engineer or be even an employee that you really have to believe in uh, the mission of the organization. And obviously you have to understand that we do live in this third world condition out there. I mean, it's, it's really there. So sometimes it's hard to believe, but when you do go out there and you see for yourself, that's when you walk out of somebody's home and nod your head and go, oh, I gotta serve that home. <laughs> So I think that you have to believe in this to take on this kind of work. You have to be out there and you have to will, be willing to do this work. And also you have to create these projects and because these projects are, they don't just come out of nowhere. These projects are created and they're created by engineers. And these projects are, when they're, uh, when they're being created, it's usually by somebody who kind of puts it together really quick and. That's the reason why they're not really feasible. So, but to really put together like a really solid project, you gotta put a lot of time into it and resources. So this is where I was, I, I use the word um, leader and advocacy. Sometimes in the work that we do, they kind of go hand in hand with each other. So the other the other part is this this concept of taking on that burden because it is a burden sometimes because you're up against a lot of uh, a lot of obstacles and you have to take on that burden to be that leader to get the work done. So here's an example. It's that same slide I showed earlier, but um, all projects then start with um, proposing. I mean, you have to propose a project, but to propose a project and make it a solid project. You have to put in the effort. But what I'm really looking for are people who really, I mean, they, they want to do their work. We do get engineers sometimes, realistically, that they're just there. Um, but I would think maybe there's some of the questions maybe they ask themselves. Like, why am I here anyway? Why am I in Chinley? I could live in Phoenix. So, I'm always looking for engineers that want to do the work. They have that desire, they have that passion to do this work. So this is also the same slide I showed earlier, but in this case, I just put in expectations here. And I think in every level, the, the people who are in these positions are advocates. And you're, you're advocating for the homeowners, you're advocating for those people who really need it. So we have these skills, like for instance, I was talking about myself earlier, that I worked with a consulting firm. So I, I learned, I got all these skills, not just from here, but also in the consulting after, afterwards when I left from here. So what do, what do I do with that? I mean, I got enough skills, can I just go back and use it? So that's what I did, and I realized, uh, I was a little naive from the beginning, but um, I, I didn't realize it, but I just discovered that this is what I really want to do. That there's people out there that are in need of, of our services. So this is kind of a story. This is a really quick story. This is about me. Um, I wasn't the office manager then, but the office manager is the one that's responsible for um, regulating the workload of the field technicians. They will say, okay, I approve your workload. Okay, you're okay with that. But what I was doing is I was trying to create this particular project and I was taking up more resources than I needed. 
So there was once once uh, I was told to wrap it up and just call it good and just document it and then move on to the next project. So what do you think I did? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is what I did. Um, I I still pursued it. So the project was denied two more times, but partly because I was new at it. But also, I, I realized that there are other people involved that I can that can help me with this. You know, stakeholders that, that can get involved. So there's stakeholders, and then also the different funding sources. I researched that there's a lot of different funding sources out there. But in the end, it got funded. Um, so 400 Navajo families are not going to get water. They're over there in the process of getting water. So the whole cost of that is $10 million. So I was able to do that and just because I, I really wanted to. So it's, this is where, this is where, these are kind of people I'm looking for that can do this kind of work. Because a lot of times the kind of work that we do, you're not told to do that work. You have to create the work. You have to have that desire to help those people. Sometimes you have to kind of go out of your way and even get in trouble for creating this kind of work. So this is the part where I was mentioning earlier that um, there's all these people involved when you're creating um, a project. There are some people that really want you to create the projects and then so we can give them the water. But there's other people, it's, it's so hard, they're, 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 it's really hard to work with them. Like for instance, these two, the BIA and the tribal utility, you get a lot of no's, like no, 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 no. So you can't do that. No, you can't do that. No, 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 you can't do that. And then sometimes you might get field staff. You tell them, okay, you need to do this, and they, they don't do it. Okay, I told you yesterday to do that. So that's all part of learning to work with people. And then there's headquarters, basically our bosses, and they would tell us, hey, how come you haven't built that yet? We funded you three years ago. How come you haven't built that one line yet? And then, of course, the politicians here could be local officials or it could be uh, elected officials and they're always knocking on our door and they're telling us we need to build that because my constituents have told me they're forced to really tell me to go after you to build that particular project. So you got to walk that line of working with everybody. So that's the reason why when it comes to larger projects I like to have engineers involved because it's a part of their development to work with the stakeholders. So I'm kind of in the home stretch now. Um, this is the one thing that I didn't learn is how do you be a great leader? And how do you I didn't learn that here, so I didn't learn that from Bob or <laughs> <laughs> any school, I think. Maybe maybe you do a little bit of project management, but really it's more about managing a project. But usually leadership um, is taught when you get a job, when you start working. That's when you start learning this stuff. And then they're self-taught, you know, over the years. But that's if you choose to, if you really want these skills, that's when you can learn that. But it's usually after you leave from here, when the students graduate and they get a job, that's when you can start developing these skills. Okay, so here's here it is right here for the students. <laughs> so advanced degree versus a bachelor's degree, in, in my opinion. So we have a, we have a, I don't know if we're still here. Um, this is one of the faculty members in engineering. And I still remember this. That's what, he, that's what he said to me. So I try to practice that. Oh, is that you, Bob? <laughs> no, 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 no. It gets easier. <laughs> but, uh, um, but it's interesting that even though you don't have the leadership skills, sometimes when you get a job, you're expected to lead right from the get-go. So any job that I had before IHS, it was all just me and me. Just, okay, do the design work, and I'll sit down and do the design work, and I was done, and give it back. Okay, here it is, I'm done. Give me another one. There's really no interaction with other people in the office. Okay, you should do this for me, you should do this. There's none of that. 
So when I first took my position with IHS, they were coming to me and saying, okay, what does Pete think? Okay, what do you, I don't know. Because I had that advanced degree, they wanted me to make decisions for them. But I real, then they realized at the end, oh, this is a regular, regular guy like us. Let's go to him. <laughs> <laughs> He's just like us. He's just like us. And so basically, the expectation is there for you to lead technicians. It could be one technician or it could be 10 people. Or it could be the people who were once your peers when you started off, your other engineers. And now you have to lead them. You have to lead that, those professionals. And then eventually you get to a point where you actually are leading that organization. So, okay, so to make this happen, you have to make decisions. Right? I mean, in a program to go from here to completion, there's decisions that have to be made. So who makes those decisions? Well, that's the person facilitating that project. Or it could be that organization. And that could be somebody like me, or it could be the next engineer coming. So these two, I kind of wrap, it, wrap up what graduate students do. And these two right here, you're, this is all you do every day, I think. All day, every day. Because that's, I know this because that's what I did here. So you understand your research, the policies. And this could be like, for instance, your research topic. And you're, you're learning to do that here as a graduate student. Then once you understand that, you're actually taking that information. And what are you supposed to do with that information? How does that relate to your research? So that's where. You're trained, you're trained to do here as a graduate student. So once you understand and know how to do this, okay, what are you supposed to do with that information? And there's somewhere there's a decision that you have to make. It could be about your own research. Should I do this? Should I do that? Should I do that? Uh, so that's what this is right here. Is you have to consider the alternatives and then make a decision. And then with that decision, sometimes you have to make a decision maybe in 30 seconds, maybe maybe less than 30 seconds, you have to make a decision. But sometimes they would ask you, okay, we need a recommendation from you, provide the, all the calculations and do the design and come up with a recommendation to us and then document it. That could be like a technical memorandum, so it could, maybe that'll give you a couple of weeks to do your report to make a recommendation. So really comes down to making decisions, I think, to, and this is where I think it's the, the basis and the reason of getting those advanced degrees. And like I said, this is my experience and, and this is what I've learned and this is what I believe in now, but why uh, those advanced degrees come in. Because as a bachelor, when I was getting my bachelor's, we didn't really do a lot of, maybe one class, did. but now as, and as a, when you're doing research as a graduate student, you're really trained, you're being trained to do these two here. So now they come to me now and say, Pete, what do we do? And now I can make a decision and oh, okay, this is what we're gonna do. So this is my last slide. Uh, one of the things I mentioned earlier is this having that desire to help people, having that passion. So it could be with IHAS or it could be with any any organization you go into this. I mean, oh, I went the other way, uh, right here. So you have to ask yourself what drives you. And I recommend that um, you could be the best number cruncher in the lab. You could be the best modeler research. You can create models. But you have to ask yourself, well, okay, why are you doing that? You could be good at all these different tasks. What are you, what's the application? What are you supposed to do with that? So going back to using myself as an example here, that um, I got pretty good with selecting pumps. I was doing that in the private sector, but I was also doing that with Indian tracks, but currently that's what I was doing. I mean, what I was doing as a, as a field engineer. So I'm asking myself, do I continue to do this? And the whole driver, in my opinion now, is to make money. So do you want to make money? Um, because sometimes I'd be driving in Denver, um, I'd be driving down the road in the freeway, leaving work, going home, and I ask myself, yeah, I, 
did a really good job of creating that memorandum. I almost figured we slipped in the pump based on my recommendation. Of, but who did I really help? Who did I really help today? And I felt that wasn't my skills and everything that I was developing wasn't really going anywhere. I just, again, I'm talking about my own opinion. But I realized I can use those same skills to help people who are in need. So that's where I, I felt like I um, discovered my passion is to help those people. And then also the other thing is to consider is the stability um, and location. I really enjoy where I'm at. One of the two places that I really enjoy living is here in Tucson. And also in Denver, those are because of the outdoor activities, and I really enjoy that. But also, um, I really enjoy where I live now, among Indian people, because that's that's who I am, and then I'm continuing to help them. But also, I'm involved with other things related to um, just the cultural aspect, all the cultural activities. So I'm more involved with that. Whereas if I was down here, maybe I would do it, uh, maybe during Christmas or certain times of the year that's it whereas here it seems like there's more constant exposure and that's my personal preference and i would say that um, as a professional um, it's okay where you get a job I mean, because that's, that's what i did so, I, mean, I moved in different locations and eventually made my way back but it's also okay to find that job that you like it could be here in tucson or phoenix or san diego if you're actually using those skills that you went to school for. But what I'm looking for are those people who really do want to help Indian people because we're in dire need of it. That's all I have. Yeah. So what, what sort of mobility is there within IHS? How likely is it that you're going to remain, say, on the Navajo reservation for a career? I could. I could remain there for until I retire. Um, so that you can move around from this is this from here. This could be one district right here. So this district can be in Wonder Rock, or it could be in um, Escondido, California, or it could be in Bemidji, in Minnesota. So there's a lot of mobility here as being an engineer. You can. You can stay with IHS and you can still move different IHS facilities. So I believe that's the case with any profession within IHS. And while well, being with IHS, you can go to a lot of facilities and a lot of um, offices. And it's also the case here to, to be director if there's a position that ever opened up in Portland, Oregon, I could apply there if I wanted to. or Maybe I want to do something higher than this in headquarters in Washington, D.C. I could do that. But some people really enjoy the technical work right here. This is where they like to remain. And that's OK. We need people like that. And then some people, and they really want to get here as fast as they can. And there's challenges with that because they don't really have the organic experience here when you get into that position. Last question is, what fraction of your employees in the local office are Native Americans? Um, in my district, all of them are. All of them are, are Navajo. But when I first started uh, with IHS nine years ago, um, four or five of the engineers were not from the Navajo area. They weren't Navajos. So it's not just um, Navajos that I'm looking for, but it's anybody. It could be somebody who is from the East Coast that could get a position out there or with an IHS. But I feel we need the word from the Navajo area <laughs> and Alaska. So that's why I'm always advocating for Navajo. Well, along those same lines, I guess, is there a position that you could maybe attain at the tribal government level? Um, just because I think Navajo has been notorious for um, failing at the housing level of providing housing, and I think this infrastructure with it, that you're doing with um, with uh, subject tanks and you know the um, just the work that you do is kind of relevant to that. 
And I wonder if you can also, you know, kind of move up to that, I don't know, or move into that position, not move up, but move into that position where you can kind of advocate in terms of providing more housing, sustainable homes that are going to be long lasting. Yeah, yeah, we need people like that. And we need people in general that are educated and have that desire to move back. So sometimes we do get people who barely got their degree and they just want a job. Whatever practice that they um, develop, is, they continue those practices within our organization. So we're getting away from that now. I think there's more accountability and more uh, transparency now. So we're getting more work done with less people. But to answer your question, um, yes, you can do that. And you can probably do that within this range in your career. Um, you can get involved with the tribe. Um, you could even leave the whole federal agency and work for the tribe directly. I know some of the engineers uh, here um, uh, got into <coughs> NTUA they're as engineers, so they work for the utility for NTUA. So they still continue those um, the skills. Um, I know NTUA sounds like it's really nice, and, but they have their they have their challenges. Especially, like just internally, they, they have a they really struggle with internal communication. So that's another good example there that if you can manage the field staff, uh, maybe the office here, and maybe have a really good understanding of the whole design process, then you can take that to NTUA or it could be to a, a tribe. <clears throat> So Pete, I'm curious as to whether you have any say in bringing in interns or is that sort of an area decision? And then the second question related to that is, I know IHS does scholarships, but someone like me who thinks about IHS, I think about the health professions like doctors and nurses. I never really think about sort of the technical yeah. people and are there IHS scholarships yeah. for people that go into these like engineer BA level degree programs? Yeah, I just didn't know about it until I started working for IHS and I wish I knew about it. I would have stayed on longer as a graduate student. <laughs> 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 but um, yeah, there, there is money to, uh, there is, there is some uh, scholarships available directly from IHS. For the so, engineering for the so engineering it, field, yeah. So it's not really just for the health health professionals. So I didn't know about that, but yeah, they would give you the scholarship, and they give you, I believe, monthly stipends, and, and then there's also um, I think you have to give back to them for the crew. I don't know how much sure. time, two or three years sure. okay. with them. And then also there's a loan repayment program too that they have that they offer. So the more remote you are. Uh, like Mini Farms is a really good example. It's one of the most remote in the Navajo area. So they actually give uh, higher priority to those engineers that are in the most remote areas. So we actually are considered to get your loans paid off because that's where the most need is. So if you want to live in Shiprock or not, Farmington, Farmington has an office. And you're among amenities, you're living in town, you're not living on the reservation. Well, chances are they're going to give that, um, you have a higher likelihood to get the money from your mini farms and not in farm two. How about your internships? Uh, yes, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we're, we're always finding ways to bring in students. Uh, Bronson is right here. Bronson, really good to, good to see you. So, Bronson is an engineering student, and he actually was involved with how long to come what? So, yeah, so Bronson here, the, he's still a student here. Um, good to see you, by the way. <laughs> so Bronson was in our office, and then basically I had a say in that. So yes or no. Uh, so I'll say, say yes, bring him in. Um, so he was hired directly by IHS. But there are other ways we can do, like through NECA. NECA is the one with the, they're the construction firm. And if we have specific people in mind, we can say, I want these three hired, and I'll send them to NECA, and they can, they'll be paid by NECA, but they will be employed in our office. Mm -hmm. So that's another way to, to, to do internships. Mm -hmm. um, 
right now we have one one person. He's a he's just a regular employee, but he's doing a lot of our closeout work for us. So we can go that route. So there's all these different options that we can look at. So everything's kind of on the table. So another way is perhaps maybe an engineer graduated and they're looking for a position and they, they can't find it, but maybe they're from that area. But we can bring him in through NECA, not as an IHS employee directly, but if we like him enough, they're doing, they're doing really good work and we could approach HR and tell them we want to hire this person specifically to work in this office. So we could do that. Whereas before, it would be a blanket announcement uh, we would say we want an engineer, and a lot of times people didn't apply. So what we're discovering now is that it's better to have somebody in mind when we hire somebody. So if you know of anybody, also do you want to come back? Uh, have my email address. <laughs> how do you recruit for your positions? Like, like how would a student here who's finishing up in engineering know that there's job vacancies at IHS? Uh, well, we're right now we're saying that we need we need engineers, and we can go through NECA, and that's one way to do it, just to get them on board with us. Uh, but with because it's a federal agency, it's sometimes it's a little bit more challenging and time consuming, and you want somebody in with HR, and it could be six months before you even make the announcement for the position. And then you have to go through the process of interviewing people and then you finally select somebody. Once somebody's selected from there on, there's like a background check and it's like another four months. And yeah. Whereas when I was with Brown and Caldwell, I interviewed with them for one day. The following morning, they gave me a call and said, hey, can we start today? <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's not the case for IHS. <laughs> I'm just curious, what's the, the range of engineering disciplines you guys support? Yeah, we're, we look, we're looking for um, civil engineers and environmental engineers. Um, just because of the this type of work that we do. Um, so usually, I, mean, I think mechanical can probably be in there too, but usually we need somebody who knows about mechanical processes. Pump, pump, pump design, have another example. So probably the third one could be mechanical engineering on that one. But I just, Call them field engineers, but even though they could have a, a degree in civil engineering, environmental engineering, or it could be mechanical. Hey, do you guys um, find any benefit to students that go to interview or to the college and might like take that field level sort of coursework? Or I don't even know if the college is. I have, we haven't done that yet. Okay. We, we, have, we haven't done that yet. And we're told we're, we're encouraged to look into that. To see if we can bring in students, it's, or uh, it could be somebody who just got um, the, uh, his or her degree in could be drafting, and maybe somebody doesn't want to be a engineer, but they just want to be a uh, maybe a field technician because now we're getting a little bit more advanced now. The the people here are retiring, and sometimes what was required of them was just a little bit of writing here and there, and that was it. But now, because of the complexity of these projects, we're doing more drafting work. And then we need people who can draft on AutoCAD, on any, any of those kind of applications. So if somebody can get a degree, in, like a two-year degree certification from NTU, or it would be ideal to put them in these positions here, so they can do our drafting for us. Yeah. I'm wondering <clears throat> what receptiveness there is in the IHS to using solar power to provide power in some of the remote locations for pumping or for heating water. Yeah, we're, we were talking about that earlier. Uh, Bob and I were just talking about that. Um, so we're, we're, we're always finding, we're always considering whatever comes up. And before, on a water line, uh, or if a home doesn't have access to, let's say there's no electricity and the water line is, I don't know, maybe three miles away, it's too far to run a water line to that one home and it's not feasible. Well, we just couldn't serve them because if you needed a pump to pump the water from a cistern tank, 
but now we're looking into your solar systems now where we we're looking to creating like a package where we can create solar panels to provide power to run the pump and also to heat the, the water so those are some of the things that we're looking into um, I kind of like the idea where you're talking about Bob about the infiltration or filtration system we could I have to think about that so I guess because the reason why is uh, I was saying earlier that a lot of these, uh, a lot of the homeowners get their water from stop wells. They just go down the road and they get the water from there. They're not regulated, but maybe it was monitored or maybe it was tested for uh, water quality maybe once. And all these different parameters were, it, it, it's, in the end it wasn't safe, but they're still using it anyway. But we don't really have a say, we can't really tell them not to have that acceptable. So Pete, could you give like a rough estimate of just the tribal lands um, for Navajo, like what percentage of families still don't have running water? Like a rough percentage? Um, Percent-wise, well, it's hard to tell. We, we go off of requests. So what I mean by that is that when a homeowner comes in, they fill an application requesting for water services. So we were told from headquarters that we need to do these surveys to identify all of these homes. We just don't have the resources to do that. We can't knock on people's door, who lives here, how many, do, is there water here? We just don't have the resources to do that. So we just go off of requests. Uh, so in terms of percentage, it's really hard to say. But in terms of number of people, it's, it's a large number. <clears throat> I mean, we're talking about thousands. Thousands of people that were the homes. Yeah, because that's kind of sort of some background I give when I talk yeah. about the situation on the reservation. And I think people are still don't believe, like families don't have running water yeah. up at Navajo or you know, rural remote areas. Yeah. So I I, mean, I I got running water when I was a senior in high school. I was ready to graduate from high school. I was moving to NAU, and we finally got water. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't really enjoy that the amenities of running water. Only when I visited home, even electricity, we didn't have electricity. Yet. But I just remember just that switch. Wow! I think I was even I think I was more exciting than the electricity. And we got that my senior year in high school too. Just the fact that the light turns on, I'm like, wow. So, but people grow up with electricity, and they've always had it. Yeah. I don't think it's just like a rural issue. I think also it has to do, because like into the city, for example, with our land department, you know, um, how they do their data mapping and everything in their land survey, even that creates an issue. Uh, for example, my sister and I barely got running water and electricity into the city, yeah. in the city, like just two years ago, mm -hmm. uh, because of those land issues. So, I mean, it's not even just like a rural area. It's like that yeah, area. yeah, so, that's where the, the, the scattered mm -hmm. project is. Um, usually scattered projects are the ones where people are talking about they live close to existing facilities or utilities. and But sometimes the, there's just not enough manpower. Yeah. There could be maybe just two engineers working there and it seems sometimes that we're not doing anything and we get a lot of complaints that people tell us we're not doing anything but the fact is we're just trying to keep up with all that demand <clears throat> oh i was just going to say my my son's house is uh indian route 9303 which is cross canyon right there yeah like she's so, yeah and she hasn't i grew up there no running water um, I think there was a process where they go to the chapter house, they request that, but that's been going on for years. Um, and I was just wondering what the process was. I thought you might have like uh, compared the population versus the feasibility or something like that to see what what areas need the most help. Yeah, when there's a wheel, there's a way. Um, so we did do a preliminary study on that area, and then we do show that it's not feasible right now, but that's only because we're looking at just one funding source. Whereas we could actually break it up into maybe three funding sources and go after funding for those um, in those three areas. It's doable. I've done it before, and so it's possible. And I was I was actually getting involved with that, and then that's when 
um, the district engineer position opened up and I just did that position. So now I just kind of manage people and you know, stay in the office. I think it's also um, what what's challenging is dealing with some of the politics too and sort of, you know, families that get priority but also families that get preference. And because I have a home site at Fort Defiance. It's up on that pink hill. It's on the yeah. pink hill. Yeah. And I grew up there and we didn't have electricity or running water. Yeah. Finally got electricity, I think, by the time I went off to junior high. And yeah. We still don't have running water at the house, but now it just sits vacant. And I certainly could go home, take a job, live there, but I wouldn't have running water. And the thing is, is that I know I wouldn't be a preference as a client to get running water because you know I'm not elderly, I'm not a veteran. Um, it's not like I don't have means to go and haul my own water. So I think that's yeah. sort of another sort of infrastructure issue why a lot of people don't go home because you, you might have a place to live, but yeah. there might be, you know, just not access to some of those basic yeah. utilities. And, and we, we still have an outhouse there too. We don't, we don't really have the, yeah. the sanitation. Yeah, we, we, we look at efficiencies. What's, what are the existing deficiencies? When I first took this position, I was really gun ho about helping people. And when families came up to me and they're telling me, I'm going to move there, please give me the water. So I was putting them on projects and probably five, six, even today, those homes are still vacant. And I asked myself, or asked myself, who would you have served with the money? To serve that vacant home, and there's always elders coming in. And there's always these people really needing it. I could have served them. So now that money, the amount of money we put into serving that home, is, um, seems like a waste. It's government money. So I learned that, and usually when people say, that, "I want to move back," yeah, I want to move back. Said, okay, great. Come in when you do move in. <laughs> move back. <laughs> so. <coughs> Yeah, that's that's uh, always hard because people do come in and ask for services, and we go out there, and then there's nothing out there. <clears throat> how 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 much do you deal with um, long-standing existing water pipelines? Like I, you know, I have family in Chimney, and for the longest time we had this. Um, sediment in our water that made the water yellow or brown. Mm -hmm. So the rule is if you live in Chinle, don't buy white clothes. <laughs> they would turn brown or yellow. Um, and what I was told is that it's because the piping is was just so old and corroded, but it would cost so much money to replace the water piping. So people just sort of put up with it. But you know, it's I. I I went to another presentation about three weeks ago about water, and I was texting my aunt in Chile to say, is the water still yellow in Chile? <laughs> and she said, it's gotten a little better, but yeah. she said there's moments where you know they might have like a period of, of brown or yellow yeah. water. Um, is there any resolve in that down the road? Cause, there, there is, Because yeah. this was like going back yeah. in the 70s, 80s. You know? Yeah, there, there is. Well, well, first of all, the the coloring and all of that you're talking about is actually what, what's referred to as a second secondary drinking water standard. So it's still you can still drink it and you're you're okay. But for IHS and even in TUA, we're looking at the primary drinking water standards. We want to make sure that all of those chemicals and everything that's listed is all within a certain concentration. And it is for the Chinese system despite what it looks like. So you could go over there and even though it looks kind of hard, you, <laughs> you can drink it. I, yeah. And being in many farms, it, it's the Chinle system is also it goes all the way to many farms. And I used to drink it. Oh, okay. So it's just fine. And, but they actually are addressing it for political reasons, and uh, they received funding for a water treatment plant. So all the uh, water that's being pumped will then go to this water treatment plant. They're going to get rid of all that and stuff. 
you know, they, they get clear water. But the problem is that there, there is a lot of sediments in the pipe right now. It's not because of the coloration of the pipe, but because of that okay. settlement, sediment that's coming directly from the well. Mm -hmm. um, because those wells, but the pipes are really, I mean, they're, they're like that big water, water pipes. But when you're pumping from the well, the velocity of that is like really slow. And so all the solids are just settling over the years. And there was, there was a picture that I would really like to show it that it, um, they did like a cross sectional. They did, yeah. they cut the line and probably like almost half of it was just the solid, it was just solid <laughs> clay. <laughs> but uh, they are cleaning it up there. They, they had their, like if, I don't know if you've gone back around the school, the housing area, on the road that goes to Nalsalini, uh -huh. they're doing a lot of work right there. They're doing more flushing, so they are trying to get rid of all of that stuff. It's for political reasons, nothing else. Are there big correctional facilities going? Yeah, <laughs> right there, yeah. yeah. So maybe when you do move back, everything will you can buy white clothes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm glad I came back, and it's uh, an eye opener for me. It's been what 13 years since I left Bob. It's been a while. And I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bob was. Uh, he used to have basketball, and every Friday we play basketball. I still have that basketball. Like, so I don't know if you guys still play basketball. It might be going on, but it's not me. Yeah. So we had basketball. <laughs> <laughs> we had uh, seminars every Friday. First thing we put in the posting, we would have to buy a food for the. <laughs> I still have the seminars. It's too much fun. Do you still have the seminars? Yeah, like one at five o'clock today. <laughs> no, no, yes, no, I asked uh, I asked you guys if there's any food and said yes, all right, sign me up. I'll come. <laughs> there's free food. Uh, one, one, one comment I just remembered about the, it's a cultural question is about um, not understanding what's there right now. That's you know, we still have people in the higher up. They're 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 more traditional Navajos. And usually um, they're afraid of new ideas and they don't want to introduce new ideas and they don't want to incorporate these new ways. And that's why we really want the younger people coming up because they have all these ideas that we want to incorporate it. And I'm thinking I'm coming up with the better or the best ideas, but you have these young engineers coming up and they're the ones that are coming up with these ideas. I have to accept these ideas and I say, that's a really cool idea, we'll work together. So if this continues on, these older people are tired, and then we can fix and address these problems. So right now, we're probably in that transition of the younger, new age Navajo way of thinking versus the older, traditional Navajos, who are still in those positions of influence. So the idea is, maybe when they retire, we want these people to take over and we want them to say, hey, that's a cool idea. Let's, let's incorporate it. Let's try it. So we don't really have that yet. But we'll get there. Yeah. 